Let me introduce Ruth Baumgartner. She originally, when I met Ruth, gosh, she was, well, she's taught my Master Gardener class every year since I started, and that's been 17 years, although she's been doing it longer than me. So she's been around probably as long as this program has been going on, over 25, maybe it's going on 26 years. Ruth and her husband, Urban, owned uh, Mouse Creek Nursery, and it was started in uh, November of 1982. And they had one greenhouse, and then later, as they got going, and they probably had more than this, I had the data that showed that she had 22,000 square feet of growing area in heated and cold frame houses. They grew more than 800 varieties of hardy herbaceous perennials. And in addition, they grew more than 300 varieties of unusual annuals and some, uh, some annual and perennial herbs. We used to, our group used to go up there quite often, you know, and visit her and, and she would give us a nice uh, educational event um, telling us all about it. And then when, when she retired, she and her husband retired, I think um, I've got down 2014, they did something really outstanding. What they did is they donated 1,600 perennial plants to the UT Gardens in Knoxville. And then um, they created, UT created a, the Ruth Baumgartner Perennial Collection, which forms the core of the perennial garden in Knoxville. And uh, another thing, Ruth served as president of the Perennial Plant Association from 2001 to 2003. And she also served as the group's Southeastern Director and Chair of the Educational Committee. And here's the statement I think really brings home what Ruth is all about. She's a passionate educator. She chose to make her collection public so that everyone can learn about perennial plants and their use. And right now it's a major teaching component for several plant science classes at UT. So I wanna welcome Ruth Baumgartner to the program this morning. Thank you, Ruth, for coming. All right, thank you. Um, if you see the title of this talk is Survivors. A couple of years ago, when I talk about perennials, I like to talk about low maintenance perennials. And if they're low maintenance, I hopefully they're long survivors. And so one of the things that happens is, uh, you know, every two or three years, some plants just peter out. They just maybe you need to divide them or something. But uh, I like plants that I don't mind having to divide eventually, but I don't want to have to divide them every other year. And the one that comes to mind is some of your hybrids, especially in your dramatic iris, um, do need to be divided often. And so I don't have those on the list, but there are other iris, we'll talk about those that don't have to be divided as often. And also, and I want to talk a little bit about plant maintenance, because that is important in knowing maybe a little bit about them, maybe some ways that you can keep certain diseases down. For, for instance, in Columbine, you know, they get leaf miners. Uh, knowing that if you can just trim the whole thing down after it's bloomed, all the new foliage will come along after leaf miners have already done their job. Um, but let's, let me see. First thing I want to talk about a little bit is um, perennial in the herbaceous perennial world usually means a plant that survives three or more years. Uh, obviously woodies uh, and shrubs are perennial. And a lot of people think that perennial means uh, sometimes annual. I guess if you, sometimes the word is used something that you do every year. Um, but perennial hopefully means that it comes back every year. Uh, something else I want to mention is um, sometimes we want to think that um, plants that spread are invasive. Uh, it depends on how much they spread. I like plants that do kind of cover the ground. If I'm putting a plant in as a ground cover, I want to make sure that it doesn't under, you know, the roots don't go underground, come out two or three feet away. That to me is invasive, but I do want a plant that will gradually spread over the years and fill in the area. Uh, some of the things that I like to look at is low maintenance and I'm looking at my notes on the side. I hope that's not too distracting. Uh, 
I want low maintenance plants that are long lived, require division only after several years, are not invasive, are disease and insect resistant, do not need staking, foliage remains attractive during the growing season, tolerates only a narrow range of growing conditions regard to soil, moisture, and light, and are, and are fully hardy in our area. And the other thing I wanna mention is some of you probably know that we are in zone seven for cold hardiness. That means um, down to zero. We can go below that sometimes, but it depends on how long we're below zero as to the effectiveness or the hardiness of a plant. All right, let's get started. Now I put this into uh, when certain periods of time that a plant is attractive or is blooming. All right, November and February. I walked around to see what was going. Obviously I put in one with some snow. We haven't had snow like this a few years, but uh, just to remind me where we are. All right, let's see. Now, one of the things I notice when I walk around and, and they're still looking great is your arum. It goes totally dormant. It goes totally dormant in the summertime. So it's kind of the reverse of many of our perennials. But the variegated foliage, sometimes they'll, as they multiply, the foliage won't be as variegated. But I love it because when you walk in, into the wood areas, because that's where it prefers, part shade, it's, it's a nice complement to the ground floor area. Uh, arum is uh, usually a tuber. Uh, you can get uh, dig up the whole clump and it's a, like a little horizontal tuber that you can replant. Also, when it blooms, uh, squirrels and rabbits and all will eat these berries and scatter them around. So after a few years, you'll see arum coming up in other areas. And I have bank of mine have planted where I have some of that. And that's what you see below kind of covers up because the foliage all disappears. And so it's nice to have some sort of ground cover. All right, another one that shows itself during the winter months is your one of your grasses called Carex. Uh, this is a variegated one, but there are other Carex that hold their foliage for the winter time. And I love plants that will hold their foliage. Uh, another thing you notice is some of the ornamental grasses, this is sea oats, uh, kind of a bronzy uh, color or light blonde I see here on the slide, uh, add some interest and they don't have to be cut down till say March. Uh, sea oats is bad about reseeding so I kind of like to get to that particular grass a little quicker than some of the others. Uh, here you see what it looks like in the summertime. Uh, it's an attractive foliage. The seed heads are attractive. The wind blows them. Uh, the height isn't very high. I'd say at the most uh, two, two and a half foot. Uh, so it can be planted in the front of the border or maybe under some taller trees. But it probably needs at least a half a day of sun. Our another plant I like is epimediums. Uh, Baron warts, one of their common names. I like them because they tend to hold their foliage. Now at this time of the year, the foliage look a little ratty and sometimes uh, you may want to get some of it cut off so you can see the blooms. The blooms come up maybe six inches above the foliage. There are red ones, there are yellow ones, white ones, pink ones in bloom. And sometimes the foliage is very interesting. Sometimes the foliage has markings, sometimes it's solid green but it's a low growing plant, great for the shade to part shade garden. Uh, this was taken across the street from me. Uh, there was a, a Bradford pear and a Forsythia. So that is, you know, Bradford pears are not long lived, at least they aren't for me. I usually give them 15 to 20 years before they start splitting. Uh, but Forsythia certainly is a joy to see when it starts to bloom. I told you I was gonna put some survivors in there. Some of them are woody, obviously. Now, one of the plants that comes up early and blooms early is your Helleborus, or you may know it as Lenten Rose. You know, your, your Helleborus comes in uh, whites and pinks and kind of maroon red, and they are developing some other, a yellow one possibly. 
Uh, here, you may want to throw me out now. This is dear old monkey grass. But be aware that in monkey grass, you have clumpers and you have spreaders. So you want the clumpers to even edge a bed or to use as an accent. And, and of course, when does it bloom? It blooms in August. But isn't that wonderful to have something that blooms that late? I um, love things that come on and do something when we don't have as much bloom time. And this is known as Monroe white, and it's very white. Some of, some of the white plants are known as white. They're kind of gray. And some, I have to be sure that I don't put those two whites together because it makes one look muddy and another one looks clean. Uh, another new introduction is uh, PD ingot, which is a yellow leafed or golden leaf uh, monkey grass. And I have found that it does best if it gets morning sun and afternoon shade because it tends to bleach out and tend to burn. Now, one of the things I'm doing with monkey grass, this is the time of year to cut them all the way to the ground before a whole lot of new growth comes up so that you don't injure the new leaves coming up. Uh, brother has this multiplied in my yard. I'm looking out the sunroom and there's a whole bed of it of grape hyacinth and it tends to reseed into the garden and the grass and different places. But the fact that it blooms now early and it's tough and it doesn't disappear, uh, I think it can be added. I'm looking around in my yard and I see places where I have foliage coming out, uh, especially some spireas with the leaves. And I'm thinking I need to move some of those clumps next to that because they such a nice contrast. And walking around the yard early, this would have been back in February, I see the daffodils coming up and uh, they definitely are survivors as compared to tulips. Now tulips will last for me a couple of years maybe, and then they're usually gone. And I love tulips, but you have to think of them as uh, one or two years of giving you beautiful blooms. And here's those same daffodils blooming, as Johnny says, with the Mahonia, mm -hmm. which does tend to reseed. You got to keep pulling out. I found with Mahonia, though, if you have a glove on and it's rained, uh, the little plants come out very easily. Mm -hmm. But if you let it get dry, they're tough to pull out. And with a glove, the little thorns don't bother me. But Mahonia is evergreen. And it's a broadleaf as opposed to many of the small leaf evergreens. And she says the birds love it, yes. <laughs> All right, not the best photo of Mondo grass, but there's another evergreen uh, that stays with you through the winter time. And there's different heights. There's the miniature ones, and then there's the medium size, which is about four to six inches. And then the taller one can get up about a foot tall. But they're evergreen and they and they gradually spread. I don't consider it invasive. And as it spreads, it also keeps most of the weeds. I have to pull a few few weeds out occasionally, but uh, it is just a nice ground cover. And I think it does best if it gets part shade. Um, I'm tempted to put some in more sun. I'm going to see how they do. But uh, I know in my shaded garden, it's really doing well. All right, a Nippon lily, a uh, wonderful foliage stays with you through the winter time. Uh, it does scorch if it gets too much sun. Uh, bloom is nothing to talk about, but the um, foliage is just wonderful. May, this blooms in May, very fragrant, sweet box. Uh, gradually spreads, as you can see out of the, in the top of the photo there, uh, the slide, you can see it gradually spread, but it's not invasive. It's just, but I love it for, because it's evergreen and you can see maybe some of the blooms a little bit there, but it's very fragrant. And it seems to do best for me where it gets a morning sun and afternoon shade or a full shade seems to do okay. I took this photo of lamb's ear because here I was walking around in February and, and there was some 
interesting uh, little foliage coming up, maybe not attractive. Some of the old foliage maybe needs to be pulled out, uh, but it's evergreen and it's gray. Uh, I'll say this again, when you have gray foliage, you need really good drainage most of the time. There may be some exceptions to that. I majored in biology and the two things my professor stressed, don't use the word always or never. <laughs> Uh, and there you see it when it's blooming. There are some uh, lambs here that do not bloom. There's a carpet variety. There's also some miniature ones. But my favorite of the lambs here is Helen von Stein. The leaves are larger and it doesn't seem to mildew uh, a lot like a lot of the others. I gave this talk several times, but I gave it to landscapers one time and, and we were talking about what was in doing in November in December, and December, and the young man asked me, you mean you got those roses to bloom <laughs> in December? I said, no, I just took this later just to show you what lamb's ear eventually does. All right, March, April. Uh, here you see some columbine and some mountain uh, bluet. Um, one of the things I wanna stress is know your plants. It's easier to maintain them if you know them, read all you can, note where the author lives. That's something I always check with my gardening books because if they're in California, especially uh, Northern California, they might be zone seven like us, but the, the con conditions, growing conditions are different. They go through a spell of rain for six months and then dry for six months. We sometimes kind of do that but we tend to have a longer moisture season than they do. Also, uh, their plants may get uh, taller than what we're used to. Uh, also, a, a lot of the labels are printed for the New England area or Mid-Atlantic Mid area, which is be like Chicago. Uh, so the time of bloom may not be the same. Uh, the growing conditions, uh, are cooler and we do go through a hot summer. And so that does make a difference. All right, um, Amsonia, not the best photo, but this was the perennial plant of the year in 2011. Uh, foliage is kind of a blue green and this is a pale blue that blooms in the springtime. Um, something else to note, there are shorter varieties of this. I have one called Blue Ice. I don't think I put it on here, but both of them, even the short one and the regular size one have beautiful yellow golden foliage in the fall. And uh, so a plant that can give you bloom in the spring and then beautiful foliage in the fall is worth having. Um, <clears throat> there's Blue Ice, I didn't know I had that on there, but it only gets about a foot and a half tall and has the pretty light blue flowers in the spring. Columbine, I already mentioned about leaf miners uh, trimming it down if you have a problem with that. Of course, this is our native columbine. Any of the columbines are great in the garden. This one particularly tends to reseed for me, so I love it for that. I put this in there, this is, uh, Maybe you know the old fashioned name, Japonica. Uh, this is the white one uh, that I just love because it blooms early. It blooms before Forsythia. Uh, and it's, I'm looking out my sunroom. I can see it's pretty much all disappeared by now, but it's wonderful early. Father Gill is another shrub that blooms early. No foliage on it. And then the foliage comes out. And it, the foliage on it is also a nice pretty blue green. Uh, another one that hasn't quite bloomed yet in my garden is your uh, Spanish hyacinths, Spanish bluebells. There you go. <laughs> there is a white one uh, also, if you like that. This tends to uh, reseed somewhat like the grape hyacinths. And when they come up, I say, oh, yeah, I can remember where that is so I can move them, put them together. Because I always like a show. If you can plant more than two or three of something, uh, it makes it better, especially when they're small plants. Candy tough. Uh, I love candy tough because it's, it does hold its foliage during the winter months. 
But one way to keep it from being so leggy is immediately after it blooms, trim off those bloom heads. Uh, save the seed if you want to and scatter it around. Of course, if you have planted a cultivar, which there are several, some have larger blooms, some get thicker on their own, you may not want them to reseed. Of course, the other way to propagate this is to just let some of the uh, spreading arms uh, just bury them in the ground and uh, they'll root that way. And that's the way, the best way to get cuttings. Now, candy tuff is really a subshrub. So you really can't get in there and divide it. It has a woody main stem. So the best way is to probably what they call layering it. One of our natives, crested iris, low growing. Uh, one of the interesting things I've learned over the years and Johnny's sitting near me, she's the native plant person. But what I learned is it likes alkaline soil. We tend to have acidic soil. And in the forest, when you see it, it's usually up against some limestone rocks or near some. And she says gravel. Yes, especially if you've got limestone gravel. Uh, that's what it likes. Uh, if you put it into good soil, a lot of times you just rot them away. Uh, they do best really with half a day of sun, but they'll do great in, in full shade. And there is a white one called Tennessee white um, that's an attractive plant. Now, you can really throw me out now. This is Virginia creeper. And if you garden, you know, the birds just like to plant that everywhere and let it just climb over things. But this is on our old barn, which has been painted black uh, with uh, oil and something. I forget what my husband used. And I just let it climb on that barn. Um, I don't, I love the variegation with that dark background. Uh, woodland phlox, another great plant and tends to reseed. I see some dandelions in this photo. <laughs> They're also coming up too. Uh, but woodland phlox, there's the pinks, there's some white ones, different shades of purple. But how refreshing they are when they come up on their own. Sometimes they reseed into the grass and uh, my husband being nice, he'll mow around them and leave them for a while and then come back and mow them down. Creeping flocks. Remember when you're dealing with flocks, you have plants that love sun or a lot of the genus, you can't always put everything into sun or always put them into shade. But creeping flocks obviously loves the sun. I think the way to keep it looking great is to mow it down high if you can or trim it. Uh, it just makes the clump a lot thicker. And of course it comes in lavender and pinks and whites. Uh, the lavenders is my favorite because I think it mixes well with a lot of things. There was a lady down our road, I think she's passed away now, that every time she'd go to the garden center would buy another pot of phlox. So she'd plant them on her bank and it looked like a patchwork. And it was really very attractive because she had, had done it evenly across, not just one little section. And uh, it really looks great. But when you're looking at something from a distance, uh, like when you're planting pansies, for instance, uh, you want it to be basically one or two colors to be seen. If you put a mixture that you see from it, it doesn't show up as well. So I suggest put mixtures up close to the house and solid color away from the house. Comfrey, this is dwarf comfrey in the herb family. Obviously herbaceous, you shorten it to herb, means soft stem. But uh, comfrey is another one that keeps a, its foliage through the winter time. And this is one of the dwarf forms that stays low. There's uh, kind of reminds me of pulmonaria because the foliage is green. What I was going to say is the blooms turn from being pink to blue and then to fade to yellow. But that this happens to be the white one that stays white. All right, Carolina lupin. Um, not a true lupin, I guess, because it kind of looks like a lupin. But most lupins do not do well, very well here. They are, lupins are biennials, by the way. So you've got to start them one summer to bloom the next. 
but the heat just takes them out. Um, delphinians are that way too, by the way. Uh, I know it was mentioned you started some from seed. There is an annual delphinian that I like. It's really deep blue uh, that I like to sow, but I treated it, it's an annual for our area. But anyway, Carolina lupin is kind of a soft yellow, uh, gives you a little height and um, it blooms early, obviously, it's in that group. My viburnum out front, uh, I don't know if Johnny saw mm -hmm. that as she came in. Um, there are viburnums that get quite large. I say that viburnum is somewhere around 12 to 15 foot tall and wide, uh, but it's nice at this time to hear something blooming that strongly. There is a snowball uh, hydrangea that a lot of people confuse this with, and they're both nice, but the hydrangea needs a little more moisture than the viburnums do. Alexandria, um, I like to tell this story. Uh, when I we had the nursery, I try to find new things, new perennials that I didn't know anything about. And I saw this listed. Uh, notice it's Zizia aria. It, I, it piqued my interest because I hadn't noticed anybody growing it. So I ordered the typical when you're a wholesale grower or like I was, you, you have to buy 25 at a time. So I planted in pots like I normally did. Well, when it bloomed, I said, oh, okay, that's, that's nice. Then I walked down in my woods and there was a whole patch of it. <laughs> so, so I learned something then, but that's how you learn. You know, you make, you make mistakes or you buy something you didn't know anything about and you learn how it grows. And the great thing about learning, growing things is you see what the foliage looks like at all different stages. And that's why sometimes if you've been growing plants a while, you can tell what's a weed and what's really something worth keeping. Okay, we're now in May, June. Uh, some of the things about lower maintenance that you need to keep in mind is know the plant. Does it need sun, six hours or more? Is it part shade? Is it shade? And be careful about shade. Some shade is too dense maybe to grow most things, uh, but part shade is where so many things prefer to be. Know your soil. Is it really dry? Uh, does it uh, hold moisture and stay too wet or wet? So some plants like that, most plants don't. Or maybe you've amended your soil and it's keeping kind of an even moisture. That would be where most plants prefer. So let's see what we have for May and June. Uh, this is five leaf Aurelia of the variegated form, very thorny. Uh, the one thing I despise about it is it keeps sending up solid green that I've got to clean out and uh, wear long sleeves and long gloves. And get, it's like dealing with roses uh, and then prune those out. Uh, I'd say my shrub is about four to five foot tall and wide but it's uh, not evergreen, but it is a nice complement to other things near it. Be careful with variegated things. Uh, you can have too many variegated things together and then it doesn't show up. You need some solid leaf things around variegated to make it an accent. Okay, now we're getting into some of the full sun plants. It seems like so many of them tend to start blooming about this time. And now we're looking uh, one of our native plants uh, tends to come up, I see sometimes in open fields uh, where it hasn't been mowed lately. Known, of course, as butterfly weed. Uh, butterflies are attracted to it. There are some yellow forms. Uh, you're seeing some uh, salvia coming up through there. That's the purple. Here's another plums at this time of year. This is a low growing dwarf astilbe. I've grown a lot of astilbes and they've died on me because I didn't keep it moist enough. But this is the chinensis group that is lower growing and tolerates a drier situation. And I think that's important for us in this area. 
um, so far in the chinensis group, I it only comes in the lavender, whereas in the taller astilbe, you can get the red and the white and the pink and the rose and the purple. Um, at one time, this is a perennial plant of the year. This is your Japanese painted ferns. Uh, wonderful for contrast. I love gray. Now, this is a plant that doesn't have to have the sharp drainage like most gray plants, but wonderful contrast in your part shade to shade gardens. Baptisia, um, considered a native. When you first buy a Baptisia, you, if you get it even a one-year-old, the first stem will tend to flop. And, you, and then when the label says it'll get four or five foot tall, most of them do, uh, you wonder something, I think this label's wrong. But just give it time. Uh, my clumps around are, you know, a good foot and a half across. And right now, there nothing has in my yard has come up yet. I've had to trim all that dead back. In fact, you don't even have to trim it back. You just pull it out, and it, uh, it's easy to clean up. But it does need sun. I hear Johnny saying sun. Yes, it does need sun. And it does, uh, my favorite one is the one with the bluish purple blooms, but it comes in yellow, comes in white and uh, wonderful. So remember when you plant it, that it needs to be in the middle or to the back of your bed, not out to the front. Of course, do like I do. I like to put things out in the front sometimes to break up the bed so they don't look all low in the front. Uh, there's some yellow, just to show you, there are some other colors. One of the things I was able to donate to UT Trial Gardens was quite a few of these. And, uh, and so they planted, I, I like to tell the story. When they found out I was closing the nursery, the director called me and said, would you be able to donate some perennials to the garden? And I said, I'd love to. I said, well, come down and choose what you want. And so a couple of uh, people did come down, Andy, Polty, who's still there. Of course, Sue Hamilton has retired. Uh, and another professor came and they choose like five of this or three of that. And I said, hey, take the whole group. So, so instead of just taking a few of this, a few of that, that's why we ended up being able to send. Uh, that's when we still had a trailer and we could transport things. And uh, so we're able to send them over a thousand plants. So when they planted the Baptista, they made a whole swath of yellow together. And so when it blooms, it's just gorgeous. All right, this is a small tree that I have on my property. This is a Chinese fringe tree. We do have an American fringe tree. And I noticed that this blooms about two weeks later than our American fringe trees. So if you have this shrub, the, even the American one, realize that it's gonna get big. My American fringe tree was planted amongst some other trees, so it tended to go straight up. And I would say my American fringe tree is probably about 15 to 16 at least feet tall. So, Look at your labels. Make sure you're reading your labels so you have an idea how big it gets. I'd say this is 25 foot wide and 20, about 20 foot tall. <laughs> okay, uh, threadleaf coreopsis. Uh, threadleaf tends to come back for me better than the wide leaf. I let the wide leaf, uh, sword leaf, maybe is a better description. Uh, reseed itself, whereas the thread leaf seems to keep coming back fairly faithfully. The blooms are a little smaller, but uh, I'd say height wise, maybe a foot at the most. Full sun, almost as much sun as you can give Coreopsis. All right, so, uh, autumn fern, uh, why it's called autumn, fern, not really sure, <laughs> uh, because all the new fronds coming up are red in the spring. Uh, I grew up in Florida, as maybe some of you heard, and we always had to read the book where the red fern grows because it was based in Florida. 
And I think this must be the fern they were talking about because the new growth is red. Uh, and then that reddish turns to green and it's a tough little fern. The key though with ferns is you've got to have, most ferns need to have even moisture for them to survive well. If it gets too dry, sometimes you'll lose them. And also be aware that some ferns are evergreen. They'll keep some of their foliage and some like the Japanese painted fern will totally disappear in the winter months. Okay, another tough plant, your hardy geraniums. Notice it's called geraniums. The geraniums that we put in our pots and all our pelagoriums and not the genus geranium. Um, this particular one stays low to the ground and makes a slow spreading ground cover. Uh, there's macrorhizin. Well, there's, there's one of the reasons for its common name, Cranesville. Uh, this is macrorhizin after a little bit of frost. The old leaves will tend to turn red and then the new foliage that has come on through the summertime will stay green through and it does keep its foliage during the winter months, which I appreciate. And then uh, this is Roseanne, uh, Roxanne, I don't know why, I wanna say like the TV show. Uh, this is Roxanne. Uh, known for blooming about 10 weeks. Hope you heard that because most perennials bloom somewhere between two weeks like peonies and then the rain hits them and down they come or uh, maybe three months, six weeks to three months, possibly depending. And if you shear them, I should mention that a few times. Uh, this is another hardy geranium. Notice the fine leaves. Uh, comes in white and pink. Uh, Huconocloria, or I like some of the common names like uh, Japanese windswept grass uh, because the wind kind of takes it. This is a grass for the shade. And what an accent plant. Slow coming on when you first plant it, but eventually it makes just a very nice clump. As you can see here, planted on the edge, and it just a uh, great complement to all the different shade plants. Uh, Johnny, I'm sorry, it's not native. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Everything can't be native. All right, daylilies. You can't beat daylilies. Um, some gorgeous ones. Um, foliage gets a little tattered, but then it's one of the first things to start putting out new growth, so you know that it survived. Uh, I read one time that you could put uh, about three or four sheets of newspapers on a lawn and in a two weeks time you've killed your grass. You could do that to a day lily and it'll still survive under that. <laughs> so very tough. Uh, no wonder people get into the collection of collecting daylilies. And that reminds me, my collection started with the bearded iris. I had a lady near me where we lived in Chattanooga that sold iris and I was just fascinated by all the different colors and I tried to and I did move most of them but over a period of time I've kept the ones that I love the best because you can have almost too much of anything if you're not careful and of course the ditch lilies uh, but this happens to be a double one this one came from my husband's grandmother and uh, called Quanzo, and I did a talk on uh, heirloom perennials, and I found out that this came over on a ship that we know of in the 1700s. So it's been with us a long, long time. Spreads just like the ditch lily, uh, so give it lot, wide berth and let it fill up a whole area that you, you know, maybe distance from the house. One other thing, when you plant daylilies, they're going to head toward the sun, their bloom is. So plant it so you can, where it will go toward the sun and you can see it. What happens sometimes is you plant daylilies and you say, that'd be something I could see from my living room window. And the daylilies turns away from you like it doesn't like you. you know? <laughs> so notice that. 
Maybe it's not important to you. Maybe that's an area of the garden, doesn't matter where it turns. Pasta. There's another thing that people have gotten into, and there are some wonderful collections of pasta. UT Garden, by the way, a lady in Nashville donated 500 varieties of pasta. So if you're into pasta, you need to go up there and see that collection. Uh, you know, pasta um, sometimes gets snails bothered a little bit, but pretty much it's an attractive plant. Uh, spring bloomer, some of them bloom all, bloom in July, so you may want to add that to your collection if you're into pasta. Uh, obviously, they come in uh, variegated forms and so on. Um, we're looking here at hydrangeas. Uh, of course, the, the one in front is our native hydrangea. This is Annabelle. Thank you. Uh, PG is our other uh, native one, too. There's, there's another native one that grows in the mountain areas. Yeah, oak leaf is one, and um, and then behind that you see the blue hydrangea. A lot of times we used to call those French hydrangeas. And one of the questions that pops up to me uh, is when do I prune? And I'll go into that in a minute. But it reminds me of a story. I had a chance to speak at a uh, for a garden club up in Michigan, and at the table there was uh, the ambassador to Israel was going to be speaking to another group and we were eating together. Long story short, I said, what am I going to talk to him about? Well, his wife was sitting next to him and found out I was going to be speaking on gardening. And she's, her question was, How, when do I prune my hydrangeas? And I said to myself, thank you, Lord. I can talk about gardening, but I sure couldn't talk about Israel. So... <laughs> Uh, but anyway, your, your oak leaf and your smooth hydrangeas, common name for the Annabelle, both bloom on new wood. And so the key is not to prune them until after they bloom, where uh, as the French hydrangea blooms on old wood. So the time to prune those types of hydrangeas is right after they bloom. Right. Okay, I'm making sure I'm saying this right with the native lady back here. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, this came out in honor of those suffering from breast cancer. And it's a pink, smooth hydrangea, but it's the blooms are smaller, but it is an attractive plant. Siberian iris. When I have people come in the nursery that are beginning gardeners and asking me, what, what should I plant? And I tell them, well, plant Siberian because you can get by with maybe 10 years before you really feel like you've got to clean it up. The clump may die out in the middle. Um, but the only thing I have against Siberian is the color range. You know, they come in purple, 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 <laughs> different shades of purple. And there is a white one. Um, so the color range, I'm sure they're working on developing new colors. But the great thing about Siberian, you can plant them in the sun, you can plant them in the shade. You, they may not bloom as well or part shade. You can plant them in wet soil. They seem to tolerate. They'll do it in dry soil. So talking about an iris that can go in uh, many different conditions. Uh, there are or iris. I used to think this was mainly a water. This is Pseudochorus. Um, it does multiply very rapidly. If you have good soil, you can plant it in full sun, but it probably likes to be where it's going to stay evenly moist. I do have an area of full sun that tends to stay moist in my yard. And so that's where I have a large clump of them. Now it is different from your Oriental iris or even Louisiana iris, but Louis I don't have a picture of Louisiana. Uh, Mazas, um, I planted this along a path in my part shade garden and weeds of grass have come up. My husband mows it, but it's so short. It doesn't bloom any higher than about two inches. 
and it's in bloom right now. Uh, I noticed downstream from where I had planted it, it, it was planted along a small stream. It has totally uh, filled a large wet area down there where it gets mowed, but it's really pretty when it, it blooms. It, there is a white form, by the way, of this. Peonies. Oh, I love peonies. Wish they bloom longer. Um, I, you know, the, they usually stand up pretty good. If you are concerned about them flopping, you could put a little uh, fence around them or uh, help them stand up because the rain or wind will knock them down. But they are gorgeous, uh, great for cut flowers. And uh, they're, they're up in my yard. They're up now about oh, close to a foot, some of them. Kind of reddish color. Remind me of um, that vegetable that we like, asparagus, when they first come up. Okay, another plant that I have in part shade that I love. This is a oriental introduction. We do have a native Solomon seal. Uh, green variety but this is the variegated Solomon seal and after a few years it makes a really nice clump a uh, nice accent against all the green okay here's another native in front spigelia I would like to do better with mine I know it reseeds but you've got to kind of get it in the similar condition that it's used to it does like some sun. I noticed when we've gone hiking sometimes that it tends to bloom in a kind of an open area with trees all around it. But it is one of our native plants, one of the few that, uh, you know, talking about red, you can't find a whole lot of red in perennials. There's a few, but and there's one of them. Okay, now we're into July and August. Um, one of the comments I have right down here is, if you fail with a plant, try again. Don't give up. I tend to say, okay, I've tried that. Um, I'm not going to bother with that anymore. But sometimes the breeders will get going and they'll find a plant that will do well in the southeast that, that uh, does well in the north, but not down here. So keep looking for some of those new varieties. Uh, I noticed in even this slide, there's some bee balm. Uh, you know, there's now varieties that are mildew resistant, and I believe I'll have a slide about that. So keep looking for some of those newer things. Crocrosmia is what you're looking at, this orange in the middle. Uh, here's another native shrub, bottle brush buckeye. Uh, gets quite large, but uh, wonderful early summer bloomer. Uh, here's another rather large plant. Uh, when I first was given this variegated Arundo grass, the lady called it elephant grass, and I thought she meant that it stomped off, you know, and spread out. Arundo gradually does get larger, but it's not invasive. The only thing I have against the variegated one is it starts out variegated, very attractive, and then in the middle of summer it turns solid green. There is a new cultivar out called peppermint stick that stays variegated all summer. So you may want to look at that. Now, this is tall. So this is a great background plant. Uh, when it's in bloom, it's probably somewhere around uh, 14 feet. So keep that in mind. And what we did is we planted a clump of it out away from everything else. And we just mow around it to keep the clump large. You could... You know, some of you don't want to use Roundup. Sometimes I do Roundup when, when I, everything else has failed. I have some bamboo that I'm really hitting it with Roundup. And the key with Roundup is to stay protected. You know, long gloves, long sleeves, long pants, socks. Uh, but I've been spraying Roundup for over 30 some years and I just stay very careful with it. This is a little low ground cover, slow to come up but it has the prettiest blue. The slides really doesn't do it justice. Uh, Hardy plumbago is its common name and uh, it's just perfect for full sun. Foliage is great. I do have to kind of pull some 
woods violets out of woods violet likes to to come up crinum lilies usually considered a pass along plant in front you see some black eyed susans crinums um come in white some people know it as cream and wine lilies or wine and cream lilies they're the ones that have kind of the wine streak. You can see a little bit of that on the back of these blooms. And then there's a pink called pink bouquet. Uh, Rutabecki at the bottom there, great plant, uh, especially Goldstrom, uh, which was a plant of the year several years back. Uh, does Can reseed. Be aware in Rutabecki you have annuals, biannuals, and perennial. Uh, Black-eyed Susans. So you want if you get the perennial, it doesn't start blooming in July. If you get the biennial, it'll start blooming in June. And uh, some of the annuals, if they've been greenhouse grown, they'll have them early or late spring going strong. But those don't tend to survive, whereas uh, the perennial one is the one you really want long term. Crocrosme, I showed you some of that earlier. This is Lucifer, the reddish orange tends to lean over. First time I ever saw it was planted at the top of a wall. And I think that's a great place to use it. Otherwise you would need to, maybe if you want to keep it off your other plants, stake it, but I don't want to have to stake. So um, over a wall, probably be one of the best place to keep it. Uh, there's some other varieties. There's yellow ones, uh, some orange, solid orange, but any, any of those are great in the garden, long lived. All right, um, talked a little bit about echinacea, the purple cone flower. Purple cone flower, especially our native one, the purple essence, does really well here in uh, neutral to acid soil. If you wanna grow Tennessee cone flower, if you want to grow Tennessee coneflower, remember that it grows in the Pine Barrens in Middle Tennessee, uh, very gravelly, shallow soil, uh, likes to be alkaline. The purple coneflower, especially some of the newer varieties, you've got to be careful. They're not as long lived. I think they're trying to improve them. If you were to buy a echinacea in the yellows or the reds, when you bring it home, cut all that bloom off because what you've got to do is get the, the clump, the roots to really get well settled for the winter time. But uh, definitely a, a great plant for us. Pineapple lily. Uh, pineapple lily I thought was a house plant and I didn't think it'd be hardy here. Someone said, we got to plant and see what happens. So I did, and it has come back for me faithfully. There is a, I don't have the slide. There is one called burgundy that has more burgundy foliage and more of a burgundy bloom, which is a nice accent plant. Daylilies, uh, we mentioned them earlier, but this is a daily that blooms late summer. And it's like a see-through plant. Uh, the bloom stalks come up somewhere around three to four foot tall, uh, and it's late, and I love it for that. There is also a yellow variety of this that you can, can be used. And there again, you may want to plant it toward the front or toward the middle or toward the back or out by itself. The hardy hibiscus, be aware that there are tropical hibiscus, and then there is the hardy hibiscus. But when you've had the plant for a good while, sometimes we've counted like 50 blooms on, on this particular one at one time. They are a one day bloomer. After the blooms have kind of faded, sometimes I go around and pull some of them off, but most of them will drop on their own. Uh, I'm not one of these. If you're coming to my garden, I go got to clean up my daylilies and my hibiscus and get them, get them clean. Uh, one of the ways to tell the difference between the tropical and the hardy is the leaves on the hardy are smooth and the tropical are fuzzy. And that's one of the ways I can tell. In the hardy, you're going to get reds and pinks and whites. In the tropical, you, can, you will see, you know, the orange and the gold and obviously the red, too. 
Okay, oak leaf hydrangea, we mentioned that already, uh, late, mid to late summer when it blooms, uh, they can get quite large, so give them some room. There are, you're seeing over ruby slippers, which is a dwarf form of the oak leaf. So if you want a shorter a hydrangea. And, and do the blooms turn ruby red? Well, sort of. <laughs> Sometimes with these names, they're not as um, accurate in uh, descriptions. But this is, uh, I love this plant. All right, here's another full sun plant. This is cat mint. Now, just because it has mint in its name doesn't mean it runs. This one don't. It's a clumper. And one of the things I always like to tell people that after it blooms, trim it all the way down. And usually it will rebloom for you. So uh, I love the blue, uh, lavender blue. Full sun, uh, I would say good drainage. I did plant last year a dwarf form that only gets uh, maybe six to eight inches tall called Cat's Meow. So you may want to look for that. Flocks. Some of you, the tall garden flocks, have dealt with uh, powdery mildew on them and say enough of that. But there are some cultivars out there to look for. This is David. Its foliage pretty much stays clean. Uh, there's another one called Robert Poor that's closer to the native uh, hardy flocks that you may want to look into. Let me see. Yeah, I did put it in here. Sometimes I forget. Uh, this is Robert Poor. It also keeps very clean foliage. And there's another one I think called Grace, kind of a lavender bloom. that The foliage stays clean. Salvias, there's another group. You have annual salvias, biennial salvias, and hardy perennial salvias, and even some woody salvias. Uh, there's a man in North Carolina that's growing over 300 and some varieties of salvias. So there's a lot in this group. Uh, this particular one is black and blue. I don't know if you can really see it, but the stems tend to be black. And then of course the blooms and one of the things with salvias, uh, they need a little clipping back after they bloom. And sometimes you can encourage them to bloom again. This is one I just had to show. This is called Hot Lips Salvia. And it tends to be a little woody. Uh, the first blooms on it tend to be white. And then in this, as it blooms on, it becomes red and white. And then toward the end of summer, it's red. So interesting plant. But I do prune this back to about two feet from the ground uh, late winter because it kind of gets a little rangy and I like them to stay thicker. Okay, cup plant. This is a prairie plant. It's known for being cup plant because it collects water in the axle of the leaf and the stem. And, uh, but it gets, oh, six foot tall so you've got to realize it's going to get that tall dies uh, dies all the way down a uh, little foliage maybe at the crown and when you say prairie plant realize it one that likes full sun roots will go down quite a ways uh I guess out in the prairie they have to get established because they don't always have rain as much as we do they tend to get a little drier there but tough and definitely native. All right, September, October, the ornamental grasses come into their own. And I think you have to realize that it's plant does need a little maintenance. It, like March, I like to trim them all the way down and clean them up. And that's a little bit of a maintenance chore, but it's worth it. I love Sitting out the window, I have a miscanthus with the tops that I haven't pruned off. It just gives you something to look at in the fall and in the winter. And there are grasses that get quite tall. There are grasses that stay relatively short. Some stand up stiff, like you see Carl Forrester in there, and then some that really uh, fountain out. Okay, this is garlic chives. This is an allium. And I love it because it blooms in August into September. 
it does reseed unless you get out there and cut all those seed heads. So I put it somewhere where I let it just fill in an area. But the fact that it blooms in August is what a treat when so many things have quit blooming and are on the downside. Your fall anemones. Most fall anemones need even moisture, and that's sometimes hard for us to do. But Hupanensis, the one I have here, gets about a foot and a half to two foot tall and seems to tolerate a little drier condition. So you may want to consider that over uh, the white one, which is beautiful. A friend of mine did very well with the white ones. She had a ditch, uh, kind of a shallow ditch that she planted some and it liked it there. And I guess get enough runoff from, especially in the summertime from dew. Um, which sometimes we don't have a whole lot of rain in September, but hers really did well there. So that's a thought if you want to grow the tall white one. And there's a close-up of Hupanensis. September charm. Did I write that down? Sometimes it's known as that. But anyway, it's a Japanese anemone. One of my favorite asters. Uh, this is a native aster called October Sky. It uh, is green all summer long. And sometimes I think, you know, you're taking up a lot of garden space. But if I wait till October or last of September, it just blooms its head off. So it's really uh, helpful. Behind it, you see swamp sunflower, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. I, do, I don't have, haven't had to divide this aster. So many of the asters, you've got to divide regularly to keep them going. But this one, I just usually prune hard March and that keeps it thick and gets rid of all the old dead foliage. This is a fall blooming aster, um, stands up called Tartarian aster. The gin now is the cultivar I have. Uh, it blooms about four foot tall. It's a lighter lavender than the October skies that I showed you. And I had them planted together, but I just didn't like the two purples together. They didn't really complement each other. So I had to move this one to some other place. Uh, it multiplies slowly, but the fact that it has some height, so it's a good one for maybe to move back from the edge of the garden. I put this in there because beautyberry is a great shrub that comes along at the time of the year that we could use something a little different. The bloom is not very showy, but the berries are just beautiful. This is a hardy mum. You know, we tend to grab those mums at the garden center to add some color. And some of those, especially the yellow ones have come back for me, but so many of the fancy ones just didn't make it. And I wonder if some of it is because we let the blooms all stay on there like I was talking about the purple coneflower and they don't ever get established roots into the ground. Uh, also, the other thing that the mums don't like is wetness. I planted some small sprigs in a hanging basket and I noticed that they've come back. So that tells you something. If you can provide excellent drainage and how do you do that now? I add not only humus, to help drainage, but I also add some sand if I know it's a plant that needs some dryness. I've been accused of making concrete, but uh, it's never made concrete for me. So I guess concrete has a little sand and lime and a few other things to make it hold up and our dear old clay dirt. Uh, but this, these uh, mums are out here um, I'm looking out the window and of course they're not in bloom yet, but the foliage has come up nice. This particular one stays low to the ground. And uh, I sometimes have to trim off some of the dead bloom, but the foliage stays a little bit all winter long for me. And um, I, it starts out apricot pink. I think if you look on the slide, you'll see some of the new blooms are kind of apricot and then it fades to a white. Uh, I was talking to someone one time that if you wanted uh, 
blooms to pick for flower arranging uh, for late summer, this would be one that I'd add. The stems aren't long, long, but it still would be nice in a small vase. Sheffield pink, I believe, is the, one of the cultivar names for this. Uh, your fall crocus. Uh, if you see them for sale at the garden center or know they're going to get some in, get them as soon as you can. Because sometimes they'll bloom before you even get them home. <laughs> so get them in the ground. And then the following year, they'll come up. Just remember where they are. That's one of my problems. Okay, Joe Pie Weed, they're at the top of the slide. One of our native plants. There are different heights of Joe Pie Weed. Uh, Gateway gets somewhere around seven, six to seven foot. But our native one, if it's got moisture, can get nine or 10 foot tall. So, um, and then there's a short one too, I think called Baby Joe, that gets about two foot. Uh, but I like it for late summer bloom, and it is one of our natives. I've grown it in full sun, and I've grown it in part shade, and seems to do fine either place. Uh, when you see it in the wild, it tends to be where it stays a little damper, even if they're in full sun. All right, swamp sunflower. Uh, late blooming, tends to get a little tall. Uh, if you have some plants that get too tall for you, go out in, say, late May, early June, trim them halfway back, or even like I do the hardy sedums, the upright sedums, I prune them down, and it makes them thicker and not as tall. I put this in here because I have some re-blooming German bearded iris, and uh, they're kind of a nice addition. Um, to the garden to come up in the fall. Of course, the ornamental grasses, as I've already mentioned, um, great for the movement in the grass. The what you see really tall at the back, that's a rondo grass that I showed you. See how tall that gets? Gives you a little idea. Hardy, upright sedums. Uh, this is Autumn Joy. Starts out, looks like broccoli in midsummer, and then it turns a beautiful rosy pink. And then as it fades, it becomes more bronzy colored. And it, it Mo, Autumn Joy tends to stay compact better than some of the old house, they called them house leeks. But even with house leek, trim it all the way back to the ground so that it will be easier and thicker. Uh, Autumn Joy, sometimes I'll trim it a little bit back in the end of May to make sure it stays compact. And this is uh, an introduction from Europe, um, has the purple stem. So there are some other cultivars you may want to consider. All right, I'm about the end of where we're at. Tricertus, this is another one of our native plants. This one has the uh, gold edge, uh, variegated toad lily is the common name. A great shade plant. I don't think the bloom is that special, but uh, it's definitely a great foliage for the part shade to shade. And Culver's root is another native plant, but this is full sun. There is a cultivar called Fascination, which has the purple blooms, but either one of those. I was accused of growing marijuana, but it's not marijuana. Uh, <laughs> this is Culver's root. Uh, anytime you see Virginianum on, on the species, you know that it's probably a native. Uh, it does get some height. Uh, I would say at least four foot tall. So keep that in mind. And, you know, you may not like yucca, but I love the variegated ones. This is Color Guard. There's also the variegated with the yellow on the edge. Uh, and they are evergreen. And I like anything that's going to keep me through the wintertime. I admit that when you weed around it, you need to be careful because the, there are little points on the ends of the foliage. Okay, I believe... I'm through. And you can use rocks when you can't figure out what else to plant. <laughs>
So that's the end of this one. Thanks, Ruth. That'll be good. I think it really helps that you sent the um, handout and I hope you guys, I printed mine out and I'm sitting here checking like, oh, I want that. I want this. I like this. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm a former school teacher, so I know how that <laughs> goes. Okay. Companion perennials. Uh, many times when we're thinking of what do we put with this shrub or this plant, I originally gave this talk to a rose group. And so I was trying to think of some things that would could be planted underneath. Then I realized later on there's other combinations we need to be aware of. So I decided to, to put the perennials into groups of their height, because that's important. If you're planting uh, under roses, you want things that stay a foot or shorter. And um, so that's what this is about. Now, I, ben, I've already given you emphasis on when they bloom. Let's look at a little more on their height. So let's start with the first one. So plants under a foot. Let's see what we have. Um, my husband took that picture and I figured he was about under a foot. So, <laughs> all right, Artemisia. Notice that it's a gray foliage. And I always like to stress that when you have gray foliage, you need sharp, sharp drainage. Do we really understand what sharp drainage is? I think a lot of times we don't. Um, some things like, um, Cactus, some of that, they need 75% gravel or sand. Now, I'm not suggesting that, but I think sometimes we don't think like that. We, you know, we want good soil, but we're not thinking about the drainage. So I would say for this plant to make sure it survives through the winter when we have all the wetness, uh, it wouldn't hurt to put about 50% at least 25 to 50% sand under it. And like I said earlier, gray plants tend to need good drainage. So many of them come from Mediterranean areas like lavender. Uh, Russian sage actually comes from a, a desert area. Um, a few others that have gray foliage like that. So if you've lost it in the past, maybe that was the reason. And there are other artemisias, obviously, but this one stays uh, under a foot. Non-invasive. All right, here's Kent's Beauty. Now notice where it's planted, on a wall. Why? Another plant that likes sharp drainage. Now this could be planted in the ground. It makes a lovely ground cover, uh, maybe about six inches tall. It likes alkaline soil. Now that's important sometimes, the pH, I didn't mention that, but a lot of things that we'd like to grow, maybe the pH is too acidic and we need to add some lime. And of course, if you're a vegetable gardener, you know, especially with tomatoes and peppers, you need lime added. So here's one, uh, it's in the oregano family. So we're talking about in the herb group. The particular one is called Kent's Beauty and it has blue-green leaves. Another in the herb family, oregano, but this is a decorative one. Uh, likes to grow between rocks, uh, very compact. Um, you probably need several plants to make a showing. And uh, you notice the name is compactum. Uh, a lot of the oreganos tend to branch out and not be as growing as close together as this one. All right, there's all kinds of sedums. We were talking about the upright sedums, but this is a flat ground cover sedum. Uh, yellow flowers, blooms in the summertime. Some of them bloom in, sedums bloom in the spring of the ground cover, some bloom in the summertime. This one particularly is in the summertime. Likes good sun, good drainage, um, has small, small rosette form. And uh, sometimes the sprays get a little heavy, uh, expanded out rather, and I just trim them off. Uh, this is on the edge of a walk. 
Uh, also a great plant for uh, hillsides and banks. And a lot of the, you know, a lot of the low growing sedums are being used for rooftops. And of course up on a rooftop, a lot of times you do have really good drainage and excellent sun and probably a lot of heat. So this plant will take it. All right, the poppy mallows. Uh, Caleri Hope tolerates heat, but likes some afternoon shade. Uh, usually you find this in Texas, uh, but not necessarily in open areas. Well drained again, blooms in June. And uh, it reseeds sometimes for me if I have the right kind of uh, drainage, but very low growing. I think one stem will come out at least a foot every summertime when it's growing. Now I've already mentioned candy tub and it is a subshrub, but if I didn't say this before, you can kill candy tough if you don't give it good drainage. And I can't emphasize that enough. And I've already mentioned how to layer it because it is a subshrub. It has a woody centerpiece, center crown. Here's another sedum. Oh, there's lots of different sedums. And this, if you'll notice, is growing in a gravel bed. Then that tell you something about drainage. Notice you've got lamb's ear there. And you've also got um, a sea holly. It's a dwarf sea holly. So a lot of these things, if you've had trouble with getting them to survive, drainage probably is the answer to get them to come on. Uh, and I've already talked a little bit about lamb's ear and some of the different varieties there are. So um, I, I just think there's definitely a place for, for grayness in the, in the beds with all the greenery as a contrast. Okay, alliums. I mentioned garlic chives, which is an allium, but there's many others uh, that stay under a foot. I believe the uh, perennial plant of the year last year was called Millennium, known for being a heavy bloomer. And I'm not sure, I took this slide several years ago, so I'm, and it's not in my garden, but I think this is Millennium. It's kind of a lavender pink. Sometimes in the uh, photos, you don't get the true color. But notice how heavy of a bloomer is. And this is blooming in... Uh, uh, this slide was taken early summer. And I've also mentioned about monkey grass. Uh, definitely stays under a foot. And be sure that you're planting the clumping ones and not the invasive ones. I have some of the invasive ones and I'm trying to get rid of it. And it, gets, it goes underground and comes up, I think, in my variegated Solomon seal. I've got some. So something's going to have to give. I guess I'll end up digging the whole thing up and getting rid of, because you can recognize the root. But anyway, comping kind, great for edging. Uh, I use it a lot of times to keep mulch uh, in place. And, uh, and it's evergreen. So and I think that's why people get tired of it because we tend to overuse it maybe. Heliopsis summer sunshine. There's different kinds of Heliopsis, but this is, uh, stays under a foot. And it's related to sunflowers. Anytime you see helio, obviously the Latin for sun, uh, know that it probably prefers sun. It can take a little shade. In other words, if it has at least six hours of sun, I know it's done well. Well drained again. I've killed it when I kept it too wet or didn't put enough drainage in the soil mix. Scabiosa, especially butterfly blue. Um, I have found that it has done better than the scabiosas that I've grown from seed. And I think it's because of the cultivar and they found that this was a better behaved one. I'm trying to remember what year that it was a uh, perennial plant of the year, but I've had much success with this one. It's also known as pincushion flower. If you kind of look at the bloom, uh, you can see that. All right, perennials around two feet. 
Um, I'd say 80% of our plants are that. Now, this was taken at a scented garden in England. Um, I love that photo. But what I really am talking about is along the edge of the grass path. You see the lavender? Um, soil drain, as I've already mentioned, sun. It may need some winter protection depending on which lavender you plant. I find that the English lavender seems to be the hardiest for me. The Spanish lavender, I love the blooms on that, but it has not made it through the winter here, even with excellent drainage. So look for the English lavender. I think you'll have more success. Lavender um, can be kind of finicky about pruning back. I, you know, it kind of gets woody in the base. So I'd be careful about how far you prune it. Oh, okay. Let me go back. There's my picture of lavender. Slide, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> All right. I'd mentioned threadleaf coreopsis earlier. It gets about 18 inches to two foot tall. And I love it because it seems to be much better behaved uh, as far as surviving. Zagreb meaning it possibly came from Russia, named after that city. There's another cultivar called Moonbeam that's even shorter, and it's a soft yellow, but I find that it's not as hardy as uh, Zagreb is. All right, sedum, purple emperor. Uh, love sun, as we mentioned earlier, it comes back in May. Uh, so it won't lie. That's a nursery term, lodging. If you've ever heard that, that means a plant that opens up and lays on something else. I used to tell people, well, if you have a plant that you don't want to stake and you don't want to prune, plant a couch plant in front of it, like a little dwarf evergreen, and let it lay on top of that as a couch plant. All right, Stochesia. This is cultivar is known as Blue Danube. Um, but it's native from South Carolina to Florida. It blooms in the summertime, loves sun, takes a little bit of shade, but another one that needs good drainage. I would say 25% sand in, under this plant. And that's probably why it does well in Florida <laughs> with, all, with the sand. All right, here's a little different one. I started this from seed uh, and it was, it came pretty true. Frosted pearls, love sun, excellent dried flower. If you're into drying flower, it's great for that. Uh, has great texture contrast to other plants. A uh, little open, but a different look than many of our perennials. Aster for cardii. Um, I love it for its length of bloom. It blooms in the summertime as opposed to many of the other asters that bloom in the fall. But it tends to be short-lived. And I think this is one of those asters uh, developed in France. I don't know if that has much to do with it, but uh, probably needs some sand to help it survive better. Winter wetness certainly kills a lot of things. Um, we mentioned pineapple lily before, eucomus, I think I have the burgundy. Well, there's, this one's not the burgundy, but there's gives you a little variety in pineapple lily. And the burgundy one, as I mentioned earlier, is a burgundy leaf with a much darker plume. This is also planted in a stony ground. I went to a nursery in Southern England, Beth Shadows, and she has a, a, a stony garden. And she said originally this was the parking lot and they decided to move the big buses and all the visitors into another area. And she decided, what am I gonna do with this parking lot? And I'm assuming it was asphalt, I don't know for sure. But anyway, she just piled some good soil and a lot of rock and gravel on it and she has what she calls her dry garden and this slide was taken in her dry garden 
All right, Sedum matrona. Here you see it planted with uh, the grass called Carl Forrester, known for being very vertical. And uh, it, sedums are pretty forgiving. They'll tolerate not having the ec most excellent drainage. But I love this one for its uh, purple stems and kind of the uh, light pink flat heads on top. Matrona, if I didn't give you the name. All right, Nephitis. I mentioned cat mints before. Uh, the perennial plant of the year was called Walker's Low, and it gets about two foot tall. Not really low, even though it's called Walker's Low. I believe it was discovered being as a heavier bloomer at a nursery, uh, Walker's Nursery. And uh, it was down in the lower part of their garden. I think that's how it got its name. It's interesting how they name things sometimes. All right, Solid Dago, Goldenrod. Now, my problem with planting Goldenrod, especially some of the newer cultivars, is I have a lot of birds in my yard that like to plant the, just some of the native Goldenrods. And so when they're coming up in the spring, I can't tell if that's my cultivar or if that's what the birds planted. So I've about given up on that and I've decided just to um, grow the native ones. <laughs> but this is called Golden Gate and it's not invasive. Uh, it doesn't spread out like our native ones. That's the only problem about the native ones. You gotta keep pulling them out. I find after a rain, when the ground is pretty saturated, I can just go and pull the stem and it pulls out the root head and everything. So that's one way to contain it. But anyway, a uh, beautiful plant if you're not troubled with birds planting the seed. All right, it's a close up of Veronica, sunny border blue, discovered in North Carolina, but the company pushing it is in Connecticut. So that happens sometimes. And that nursery is called Sunny Border, so they named it after their nursery. But it's a heavy bloomer, large fat spikes on it. Foliage is very nice, kind of tough. Uh, so many of the Veronica's the leaves are very small, but this has larger leaves. And it's a summer bloomer. All right, Persicaria, Red Dragon. Uh, I grow it not so much for the bloom. Now the bloom, as you can see, is that little white thing near the uh, the anemone. Uh, not very showy, but I grow it for that foliage. Of course, castor bean up here. Well, I ought to show you. This was taken in my yard, so I can recognize some. This is an annual, so don't try to plant that. But I love this foliage for um, as a contrast to other things. Persicaria is a good reseeder. This hasn't reseeded for me, but I do use some of the persicarias in areas where I'm trying to fill in some areas. And, and there's one called, uh, that has stripes on it, like a sergeant stripes. And so you may want to look into some of those. And I've shown you this before. This is, uh, you know, when I do talks, I borrow slides from one program to the other. So sometimes that happens. Uh, the Nifophias, uh, great for um, adding verticalness in your garden. And uh, it's this, the, some of them are staying under two feet. This is an Artemisia and I love it for its fluffiness, but if you don't have good drainage, it splits open and lodges and uh, just doesn't like wetness. But the plant that I like here, and maybe I've got it in a different place, but anyway, that, let me go back. Um, uh, Veronica uh, reseeds beautifully, great see through plant, and it gets rather tall. So I'm, I'm a little confused as to where I am, but let's see where I'm at. Okay, this is um, Nephophia Little Maid. Thank you. <laughs> That's what it is. It stays under uh, two foot, so it's great for adding where you don't want it. Because most, a lot of Nephophias get. Um, three to four foot tall. 
And of course the common name is red hot poker. So obviously this is not red hot poker. All right, here we go. This is where the Veronica needs to be. Uh, but anyway, I think basically I was trying to show you the Artemisia Powers Castle. All right, perennials three foot tall. Let's see what we've got going there. I've already talked about hot lips salvia, how I love that plant. Okay. Now, remember way back, I showed you a dwarf uh, globe thistle. And when you say thistle, you know, you're thinking it has a lot of little thorns on it, but it doesn't. But this is one that has kind of gray foliage, which tells me it needs some good drainage under it if you plant it. Echinops. And then say, I bet, yeah, there's my Veronica Bonanarinensis. Uh, I told someone if I, because I haven't been pronouncing some of these words for several years, or at least a year, <laughs> I had to remind myself. But I love this plant for see through, and it does reseed beautifully, uh, even if it doesn't come back from its original roots. But sometimes some of it does. Okay, there's another picture of it behind a pretty bench. All right, Formosa lily. Um, seeds was given to me and I thought I'd just try them and they do get tall. They have a wonderful seed head that I like to use in dried arrangements. Uh, this is a summer bloomer. Likes, um, doesn't, as long as it has good soil, it doesn't want wetness. And uh, this was taken in my yard several years ago. Uh, I was going to say, I, we added a sunroom, so I know it's in my yard <laughs> back in time. But Formosa lily, you know, Formosa uh, is the island that China wants to take over, but now it's called Taiwan. And uh, I hope they don't. <laughs> but anyway. And there's that aster, my favorite aster, October skies. Divide, I have written down here, divide every five years and then trim in May to make bush ear. All right, Carl Forrester in front. Uh, excellent vertical grass. And there's, of course, some aruncus. All right, Blue Fortune is a agastache. I find Agastache has licorice smelling leaves, so you may want to consider it for that. But Blue Fortune is a heavier bloomer than a lot of the Agastache. So, but it's a full sun plant, uh, three foot tall at least, three foot wide. So it takes up a good bit of space. Good drainage again under it. All right, Gara. How many of you have planted Gara and lost it? And I think there again, uh, good drainage is probably the culprit or the solution to having Gara come back year after year. Uh, the pink one is probably summer uh, butterflies is one of the names of Gara. This, this one's called Snow Fountain. And here's Red Hot Poker again. This is uh, a little taller. It's known for uh, many different colors or solid red. This is a solid orange called Underway, apricot orange, midsummer bloomer. But Roprii, the next one, uh, is known for being <coughs> fatter uh, heads on it. But it's more like what we think of as a Red Hot Poker. But what I like about this particular cultivar, this, uh, the species is Rooperi, R-O-O-P-E-R-I. It blooms in September. And I think that's neat. And Russian sage now is not Peroskia, even though I've learned how to pronounce that name, has been changed back into the salvia group. These taxonomists, they, it takes, they say, nursery owners 10 years and the gardening public 30 to get a name change. 
So, and, and it is known as Russian sage. So they've decided it needs to be back in the Salvia clan. And it's based sometimes on DNA evidence, or maybe they found someone that had named it first. And so they sometimes honor that. But uh, Peroska definitely needs good drainage if you want it to survive. There are some cultivars that are shorter so you may want to check into that, but definitely another gray leaf. So there you go. Uh, excellent drainage. All right, here's another late bloomer. This is a cross with Solidago, which is goldenrod, and an aster. And it has a real soft yellow, small little daisies clustered together, uh, sometimes called golden aster, although I wouldn't really put it in the aster group, full sun, um, blooms in the fall. So something to consider. I, sometimes available, sometimes not. Some of these things are hard to find. Sometimes um, when I finally found some and it wasn't patented, uh, I propagated like crazy because no one else was seeming to offering it. Offering it. All right. Um, now, this is a bush clematis, not the vine. The biggest problem I find with it is it tends to lodge or it tends to flop. So this is one, because it blooms in the fall, by the way, not the summertime like the vining does. Uh, but I love it for its uh, bluish purple bloom. And uh, this would be one maybe if it's lodging too much, you may want to uh, stake it some or put it where it wouldn't matter if it lodged. All right, as I've mentioned earlier, there's all kinds of salvias. I've shown you hot lips. Uh, this is mystic spires, similar to um, indigo spires. They're very similar, but one has uh, dark stems, the other one has a, like a light gray stem. And uh, like I said, there's so many different salvias. Some of them are perennial, some of them are not. Uh, Mystic Spire, so gets about three foot tall, taller than a lot of the other salvias. And there again, uh, good drainage to get through the winter time. Okay, I am through. I know that's a little early for some of you, but um, hope that covers a lot of territory that will get your juices going about getting out there and working in that garden. Okay. Thank you very much. I had a question about, sure. you mentioned a lot about good drainage, especially for, you know, silver leafed plants. What's the best way to get good drainage or amend your soil in already established beds? I'm thinking about uh, lavender or lamb's ear that yeah. I already have. Yes. Now, what I used and still do is uh, crushed limestone instead of, I don't use play box sand uh, because I like the fact that, you know, usually gray foliage plants like a more alkaline soil. In an established bed, uh, you're obviously going to have uh, don't want to dig things up. So you could kind of dig a trench around and then amend it with some sand and some good stuff, just like you were feeding the plants. Um, I, now with lamb's ear, you know, when sometimes I clean it up and I've got some rotted uh, leaves and rotted stems, I clean that all up and I may just uh, pour some sand around on top of the soil. And then, uh, then when I'm mulching or whatever, I make sure I don't put mulch, you know, on those areas. What kind of sand do you get? I get, man, it's called manufactured sand, and I get that at uh, building supplies. Uh, it's crushed, crusher run, I think they, is what they say. Uh, okay. Yeah, crusher run. I grew up in Cleveland, too, and I used to go visit your nursery all the time with my mom and my grandmother. Oh, really so cool. hearing from you. Yes. <laughs> well, great. Uh, and I'm not good at remembering names, but I'm pretty good about remembering a face. And I'll see somebody somewhere and I'll say, how do I know you? And usually <laughs> we'll get to the point about the nursery and I say, OK. <laughs>
Ruth, what's your fertilization schedule or what regimen and, and kind of what do you yeah, use? And... I'm not very good at fertilizing, but if I use any fertilizer at all, it would be a 10, 10, 10, a balanced fertilizer. But what I rely on is my mulch breaking down. Mm -hmm. And um, I tend not to fertilize a whole lot unless I see a problem. Now, I was walking around the other day and I mentioned that I had bought uh, Cat's Meow, Cat Mint last year. And I noticed a little yelling on the leaves. And I thought, yeah, that was poor clay soil that you were planted in. So I went and ran and got some 10, 10, 10 and just spread compost. Oh, obviously, if you have compost and, you know, for sure. But you might want to check your compost, you know, have it soil tested. I, I was adding a lot of um, things that made the soils too acidic for what I was trying to do. So mm. it, you might want to consider that. But you then spread it out thinly if you don't really know what the pH is or what the plants are requiring. Well, thank you. I used to think a slope would be good drainage, but not with clay. I don't like using chemicals. I've kind of figured, you know, if you have a hundred of the same thing together, you're bound to have some problems. But if you have one or two, um, you know, nature usually takes care of it. So basically what I do is cut it out, cut out that fold and get rid of it and put it, don't put it in your compost because uh, that little booger in there is laying eggs. So <laughs> put them in the trash where you can get it away from your house and yard. First, I want to thank Ruth uh, for coming in and, and really working out. She did very good with Zoom. This is her first presentation, but I hope she doesn't have a bad taste. It was very good, actually. Yeah. It was excellent. Well, my husband has put off doing Zoom for the family. So now he has no excuse. We can do it. <laughs> That's right. You can see that we all struggle still with it. You know, we got to push the right buttons and whatever. Right. But we really want to thank you for for uh, giving this presentation today. Thanks again, Ruth. You're welcome. Been a, I appreciate it again. Say hi to Urban. Thank him for all, all right. his help. We'll see you. Bye. Thank you, Ruth. Yeah, thank you.